Um, <clears throat> so the basis of what I want to cover off this afternoon really is to talk to uh, everybody in the room about why do we need to do all of this. We've heard from a lot of experts today on different areas um, from legal aspects to uh, communication risk, um, reputation management, etc. Um, so a whole host of different areas uh, of social media, but why do we need to talk about social media at all? Isn't this just some fad? We as SMEs can sit there and go, yeah, okay, we'll leave the big companies to explore the ground and we'll copy them later. Uh, we don't really need to engage in this just yet. And really what I want to do is I want to, uh, to highlight to you some of the potential risks of not being engaged, but more importantly, hopefully highlight to you the opportunities that it provides for SMEs. Because it's my belief that um, what's happening on the connected economy is creating a level playing field between SMEs and PLCs. You can go out there on a level playing field and compete with the PLCs and in many ways you can beat them. And what do I mean by that? <clears throat> so this is what business schools talked about in the 20th century. Um, they talked about the need to listen and respond to customer need. I'm sure you've heard a lot of these things. I'm not going to read through them individually. But the principle was we talk at you and uh, we're all powerful, we're the brands, you listen to what we say. Okay? Quite a few very large companies continue to propagate that idea whilst very small, fast moving, agile companies got out there and beat them and took the legs out from under them. So my next slide um, tries to demonstrate the point on a few companies and I'd ask you to have a little bit of latitude with some of the examples I've, I've put forward. Um, but I think it's quite interesting just to, to have a quick uh, flick through this because the way that we approach business management has to change. And by this I mean what we've been talking about in the 20th century isn't necessarily true anymore. A lot of what's up there is very true, must be adhered to, must be propagated, must be a part of the way that businesses act and behave. Um, but the connected economy, the open economy, has opened up the ability for everybody to talk to business and business needs to respond in the communication in a communicative way, not just blasting out some message, as has historically been the case. And one of the problems that big businesses have, and why I think that SMEs, by being agile, can take the legs out from under them, is that uh, the, the term agile strategy comes originally from the principles of, of software development. There's a software development technique called agile. And the principle behind this is, let's try something out, sprint to a known point, review how we've done, change if we need to, and then move to the next sprint. And this method of 20th century strategic development of your business is no longer relevant in an economy where everybody has in their pocket connectivity. Because with that connectivity comes the ability for you to influence a company rather than them trying to influence you. So some of the companies out there have got this wrong. Okay, and I'd like to start with a small company called Kodak. Um, now Kodak, for those of you who don't know, at one stage held 92% uh, of the world film market. But Kodak, unlike their advertising agency, didn't understand the business that they were in. Really? A company with 145,000 employees, the board of directors did not understand the business they were in. And what do I mean? Well, the advertising agency for Kodak talked about the Kodak moment, and I'm quite sure that many of you in the room will recognize that phrase. But Kodak as a company believed that they were chemical processors, believed that the main core business that they operated in was to take film and film was their commodity and to process it and give you prints back. Unfortunately, there was a small upstart that came along 
in the form of Instagram, and I'm not saying that they are the only people who caused the demise of, Co of Kodak, um, but Instagram came along and said, ah oh, yes, the Kodak moment, but we are digital and we don't need to do the whole film processing thing. We don't need all this paper. We'll just do it all electronically. The irony is that it was Kodak who invented digital photography. They invented it, the board of directors looked at it, and the board of directors decided there's no future in this. We don't want to upset the 92% of the world's film market that we have, and besides which we employ 145,000 people. Most of those people are involved in chemi chemical businesses, and what we don't want is we don't want to upset that investment, that legacy investment that we have. So we will quash digital photography for as long as we can so that we can milk the film market. So what's the outcome? Well, the outcome is that uh, Kodak is now in Chapter 11, uh, which is protection from its creditors, 145,000 employees with very little intellectual property that it can sell in order to try and rebalance its books. It's going to go bust. Instagram, on the other hand, with 13 people and no revenue model and no revenue and no profit, has recently been sold for over a billion US dollars. That's what I'm talking about. That is the essence of what I'm talking about. So the way that Instagram operated was they saw a way to take Kodak out as did Flickr. Flickr is, is online photographic storage. Both of them happen to be owned by Yahoo. Um, and really what's happened in, in the business model for these, these companies is that uh, Kodak were the oil tanker. They were very slow, very long traditional planning processes. Strategy was something they talked about very earnestly once a year. Instagram and Flickr just went, Let's just get out there and do it. And if it's not quite right, we'll modify it and we'll do it a bit more. And then if that's not quite right, we'll change it and we'll do it a bit more. And that's the essence of agile strategy. So I want to throw up a few more examples where there have been people asleep at the wheel. Okay? So here we have Hoover. Why were they asleep at the wheel? Well, at the time, their share of the, uh, the world uh, vacuum cleaner market uh, was not far behind Kodak's share of the film market. Unfortunately for Hoover and, and this particular part of Hoover, they also have a paper bag manufacturing facility which at the time was in Wales. And the board of directors decided in their wisdom that it was worth protecting that legacy investment because that was the most profitable part of the Hoover vacuum cleaner business. So that legacy investment wouldn't allow them to look outside the box and think about what might be the future. And the future was a vacuum cleaner that didn't need a bag. And that vacuum cleaner has taken Hoover out of the vacuum cleaner market. Nowadays, Hoover's market share is about 4% of the vacuum cleaner market. And it's because they didn't move with the times. So, Sony Walkman, anyone who's as old as me in the room will remember the Sony Walkman. You wouldn't go anywhere without it. Those horrible little tapes that used to get chewed up and spat out everywhere. Yeah. Um, what I think is particularly criminal about this one for the directors of Sony is that they owned the hardware. They owned the brand name. But guess what? They owned the software too because they own a studio in America and music libraries. They're the largest music library owner in the world. But they let this upstart come along with a thing called the iPod. And overnight, they lost their market. Sort of getting a theme here. So I'll throw up a few more. If anyone wants to shout out, who's taken over from Xerox? What sort of a company do you think Xerox is? Sorry? Well, that's where they started life. It's not where they would consider themselves primarily to be now. Although it's interesting that uh, in, in their case, and I'm probably going to run out of time if I go through the case with Xerox, but uh, Xerox 
understood this problem and set up something called PARC, uh, which was the Palo Alto um, Research Center, the other side of the coast from America, uh, from the main business. And they, they put new people in there, go and invent the future. And they invented things like the mouse, graphical user interface, laser printing, ethernet. And when they came to commercialize it, they put it through the existing business. And it failed. But the company I was thinking of is Xerox is a document storage company. Could potentially be called Dropbox today. The post office and email. Did IBM have that problem? I think IBM did have that problem. And it's, it, they, well, didn't they, when it came to Apple and, and absolutely. And go ahead. Yeah. And they were asleep at the wheel, and people like Microsoft and Apple yeah. are here as a result of both that company and also as a result of Xerox. Yes. So who would you put up against Rotary? What's Rotary about? People communicating? Maybe I should put Google Plus up there <laughs> after this <laughs> afternoon. Um, so I'm going to be a bit late on time. Um, who's who? I would argue LinkedIn. That's the modern equivalent. Who's who? Who last picked up a book of who's who? It's a history business. Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion, do we mean Google or do we mean Wikipedia, but let's stick with Google for now. Um, and then finally, something that's only 20, 25 years old, text. It's already been replaced by Twitter. So these are businesses who have held on to their legacy by following a 20th century strategy. And basically, the principle behind what you've been talking about today are elements that will move you into the 21st century. But your company needs to start to evaluate the future on a much more regular basis. Strategic planning is not some airy-fairy in the clouds thing that happens once a year. It's something you should do every month. You should think about, you're one of the old guys on here, who are the new guys going to be? And reinvent yourself before they do. So the challenge for you, every single business there has lost its market because the people who have come in have undermined the core product that was there in the first place on the basis of a thing called disruptive innovation. And sorry, I'm going to whistle through this because I've been shortened on time. But historically, what we've talked about is we've talked about markets being something that are size and time related. So the idea being that you bring a better product into an established market over time. You gradually get better at what you do. Practical examples of that, you'd start with the Ford Model T maybe move to the Mini and then maybe an S-Class Mercedes. What disruptive innovation does is it says, let's change the scales. Let's think about this differently. How can we reinvent our marketplace? How can we think about what we do in a different way? And as a result of it, drive our business in different directions. So I've thrown up a, um, an example for you here. Okay. Instead of having those three cars or, or progressing through those three cars, how about if we start with car sharing? And the next stage to car sharing would be, let's get rid of the journeys completely and let's work from home. That doesn't quite work for all the practical reasons everyone in this room would understand. But I think that the next big wave of consumerism is going to be a thing called co collaborative consumption. And that basically, for, the, for a nice, neat example, would be the Boris bikes in London. Why have 500 bikes on this side of London, 500 bikes on this side of London, and have these people cycle over there, these people cycle over there, and you just swap them? Bikes is not too much of an issue, but if it's 500 cars, why not just share those cars? Why not have the principle of sharing rather than buying and consuming? And that's really where consumer markets are moving to. So, what does that mean? It means you've got to start understanding what people are buying and why they're buying it. And you, you have to think of your markets differently. So the idea is give up all of those big ideas that were on the original list because the person who's buying that, you might think you're selling the motorcycle, but he's buying back his youth. And you've got to start thinking about, so how do I appeal to, his, to buying back his youth rather than I've got a motorbike to sell? So it's a different mindset. And the mindset looks something like this. 
uh, as I say, I'm not going to because of time, I'm not going to read through all of those, but any of you who want to go to the, the website and look at the last blog that I did, I go into a lot of detail about it. But the principle is what we have to do is we have to look at markets in a completely different way. We have to start think thinking in different terms about the market we compete in. And that's what today is really about. Today is an, a glimpse at what's changing on the horizon. And you guys need to get on board, recognize it's not a flash in the pan, think about your businesses differently, and start to approach markets in a completely different way. And really, that's all I wanted to, to try and pull together those different elements of what we've heard about today. So I'll pass over to Nikki very briefly. Questions, yeah. OK, sorry, rattling through rather. 